Malkai and the Rakan, all the movement in the brawl, they can get some action done in the mid lane. There's some action to be found on this one with the drafts that both teams have put together. It is game number two in this best of five, with the stakes being whoever wins tonight guarantees that they not only go into the LCO final, but they also book their tickets to the PCS playoffs to represent the region abroad. Plenty then for the taking. Grand Zero obviously off to a flying start, crushing it in only 24 minutes. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people are curious to see if they can continue this undefeated streak. Yeah, I'm also very curious to see if they can, you know, go for that undefeated, undefeated split. You know, they can get all the serious wins, even with dropping some games. But, you know, sometimes you do want to get the absolutely, you know, no losses ga uh, garnered throughout your entire year. But a lot of the Ground Zero members have mentioned that, you know, they would like to drop games. They would like to be contested because they want to be pushed and forced to improve as much as possible before PCS. Because, you know, that's always the big goal is performing overseas in those PCS playoffs and, you know, finally bringing those back to the limelight, making sure that everyone remembers that Australia, you know, Australia isn't that bad, guys, you know, give us a bit of a break, but I'm so excited to what this early game is going to look like, and with the potential lane swap happening here, Skimmy, that is exciting. That could be very exciting, right? Make sure that this is one other way to try and shut down this Camille. Many have tried to shut down Tien on this particular champion and have failed. Oh, a level but one this cheese? This could be the difference. Yeah, it certainly could be, actually, with uh, Aladoric and Violet hovering there with Biopenfe. Tien says, what on earth is going here? Bio actually going to wrap around to make it seem as if, well, you know what? Stealing. Uh, I am going towards the bot lane. Okay, so very interesting start by Bliss. By warding the uh, camp isn't stealing away this one. You know, we have seen this quite a few times where top players in lane swaps do play to steal away the camp, but Tien is walking there to make sure that, you know, nothing... Uh, too bad happens, but I think the most important thing is this fight for mid lane priority, right? They need to make sure that both... Oh, one of them is maintaining prior and isn't able to, you know, uh, rotate to the jungle and make sure that there is too many camps being sold away from either side. So this is what top lanes really do. They sit around <laughs> mid in these swaps and just, uh, you know, try to play that muscle for their mid laner while not stealing a lot of experience. But uh, by staying in lane and taking some of Harry's experience, you know, could swing these level timings and could swing the, the, the matchup. Look at the absolute state of top lane right now. They can't even play their lanes. They just literally hover around uh, in, in mid and say, I'm not a jungler. I'm not a support. I'm just here to add another body on the map. <laughs> Feels pretty bad in that regard. Uh, I'm also curious, you sort Kevi? of talked about the abundance of damage that both these teams have. Whether or not Kevy feels the need to go for the AP variant of the Maokai. Obviously got nerfed a hot minute ago, but we have been seeing a bit more Maokai. That's usually been the tank variation. By Pemper is going to be in that 1v2 now. Shun's going to get bullied off his own red buff with the assistance of both Kevy and Aladoric. They'll have full vision of this one if they want to have a bit of a smite battle only three minutes in, but they're going to hold it just out of range for that crucial 900 damage. So they're going for the engage, Banish loss to start things off, knock him up one time, force out his flash, keep the red bramble back there, jump in again the with another bandage toss and say, well, where are you going? What was the point of that? An angry BMO is the response here from Tien. Yeah, Shun will die for his camps no matter what. And this entire time, Bio is getting experience on the bot side while Tien is forced to be started and cannot. I think this was a huge mistake by Shun uh, to not, you know, uh, recognize that he is going to be susceptible there, but this is just a really nice level one by Bliss. Kevy starts on the bot side of the map, clears up and recognizes that he's matching parting with Shun. Fire, plays for that invade and they do have, you know, even though there is a level 2, a sport versus a level 2 top laner, there is the Ignite and Aladoric's back pocket and that, you know, finding the W, finding that grand entrance is just a really easy setup for the damage they have. That certainly was. Lots of great uh, kill pressure for them to flourish with and uh, a little bit of chaos, right? In a meta, in a patch where you're thinking, you know, those lane swaps are being pushed to the side, no longer that much of an issue. It's, uh, it's nice to see one maybe not fully committed to, but at least get them some kind of advantage to make sure only four minutes in they're up by 1k. Yeah, and this is such a big deal for the early game of Bliss. The fact that Bio is so far ahead. Tien doing a really good job to cancel oh. the recall, but doing a really bad job to stay alive, Skiri. So he is going to fall down there. That is a kill going in the pocket of Violet. Bio Panther with a two level experience lead already on the side lane, pushing out this bot lane is going to make him so much comfortable. He's going to base and get such a good buy. The fact that Kevy is, you know, doing really well uh, to find first blood. This is an extremely different early game for Bliss and a really good early start for this team. Really, really good. And look how much of a difference it actually makes in terms of Harry too, right? He's able to actually play his lane out without the constant threat of people roaming and uh, and sort of taking him down. And Tien, having only just died, TP's back to lane, already back to 50%. And now it's, uh, you know, a case of uh, Grand Zero. What is our next move? What is our response? As Lemus looks to lock down by Panther. He sidesteps Bandage Toss number one, waiting for Bandage Toss number two to come out. So leaps into the wave, says, well, where are you going to go? Lima says, well, I can just lock you down. You've got nowhere to run or hide on this occasion. And in the end, Bio will crucially fall. But I think the damage has already been done, right? That two-level lead into uh, Tien's Camille is is monumental. Yeah, and they're just going to base and match lanes now. They're going to, uh, you know, get uh, avoid the part of the early game where Ash is so strong in lane and can really bully out. But actually, no, we see them 
going back towards the same lanes. They, uh, you know, the grub spawning at six minutes is their next priority, right? They really want to make sure that this, uh, this jungler, where we do see Kevy going for that, you know, Landry's first, is going to get a head skimmy. That's certainly the case. There's a bit of aggression once again found onto Fighter with uh, five members planted in the mid lane. Uh, but here's an opinion, which uh, unfortunately Race is already incorrect with Grand Zerone taking game number one. But he believed that Bliss should just simply 3 0. Is all about though if they do draft poorly and struggle to react to some of the gameplay that uh, Grand Zero showcased. And I think that was really the talking point of game one, right? Punished with a draft that couldn't fall behind. I can't believe production just did. Uh, raised dirty like that, you know, showing the 3-0 position in the second game of the season. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's proven wrong already, but I, I do agree with his sentiment. I think that uh, both these teams are quite equal when it comes to the skill department. It's going to come down to drafts and uh, preparation, and we saw in game one, uh, Ground Zero definitely had the, the early game and the draft uh, advantage, but this time, Bliss, it would say the drafts are pretty easy, just came out with a much better game plan level one and caught Ground Zero off guard completely. Completely caught them off guard, and the biggest winners are, yeah, Violet and Biopan, but they get to excel in their own individual matchups. That obviously then frees up the ability for Kevy to not feel uh, anywhere near as put behind because he was tracked from the very get go in game one. This time, with a kill to his name, with the pressure of the lanes working in his favor, he's able to get all three grubs for the boys. And something also to note is the fact that Correct did go for that blind pick, Braum, you know, is not that. Uh engage support with Leona not being removed and he cannot like really impact this mid lane especially you know we see him hovering on mid but Braum is not a good ganker he's a good counter ganker and he's a good skirmisher and a good team fighter but he does not have pressure onto champions he needs uh someone else to do that for him and that is Schoenfire but the fact that Schoenfire does not have any uh downtime right now because he's constantly trying to find camps everywhere he goes and is being denied his jungle and those major objectives uh they can't really link up with Kurak right now and with this being an evil uh, even uh, game state right now with the junglers both hitting level six here and a camp lead going to Kevy. Still another uh, early game win for Bliss right now. And it certainly is. Let's see what it means then if the dragon gets looked at by either side. If it's a case of you won't do it and certainly we won't either. We just want to continue to be ahead in the XP department. And uh, you know, whilst team's been able to try and wrangle it back just a fraction, it is still a case of uh, having to contend with this Jax. Amadora's going to have a crack at that one with the Grand Entrance jumping on in. Kurek looking to try and respond back and take them up. That concussive blows very successfully, I might add. Amadora gets completely punished. And the CC from Freljord, a little bit too much to muster. Inside the river, Kevy continuing to do that dragon. In the end, does get taken down by Schoenfire. And between the explosive shot stacked up and a true shot barrage, it's not enough to uh, force Ground Zero to back away. Yeah, a huge disconnect from the Bliss members. Kevy pulls the dragon before there is that bot lane priority uh, gathered, so he's just found out in the river by Schoenfire. Easy pick up for him because the Ocean Dragon does hurt and it slows you down, and that is going to be a lot of damage this move is able to do at this point in the game, especially with the Conqueror, but uh, a 2v2 mistake for the Bliss bot lane. You know, Eldori caught out with the concussive blow stacks, hit it up with the arrow. Violet unable to block that one with the cleanse, right, and really allow him to get out of there, and that's just that's uh, the skirmishing power of this, these two champs in the bot lane, you know, whereas they're not good gankers, they are really good at fighting, especially in the early game. Yeah, two fights, and one I'm sure in which Kevy was really banking on his bot lane, winning right for him to assist and then back him up on that Drake. Fido, early Valkyrie, really nicely timed. Did have the flash in case of emergency, but wasn't necessary to dodge out on that counter strike, otherwise that would have been a nice little kill found. And, uh, you know, make sure that the Tristana gets further ahead, but not to be. Is sitting on that Carl at the stage, 57 stacks to remain, so wants to try and just farm up an absolute storm and build that big lead like we've seen him do before. But uh, look, I'm very curious to see just how active Bio wants to be, whether or not he wants to continue to engage in these 1v1s to Tien, or if he's going to roam the map and force yet another lane swap. Yeah, just another yeah another lane swap happening, and the fact that it was spotted on that uh, that Raptor ramp ward, so, but they do know Bai is bot lane, they are peeing in the bush right now. There is no objective on the top side of the map yet for another minute, and a jump out of Harry here, but he does find that ult pit. Could be lethal, but he's going to respect the fact that there is, you know, that fog of war on the top side of the map, and if he does commit to that all-in, could be himself going down skinny. Yeah, lots of pings on the minimap. People definitely playing uh, cautiously, knowing that uh, members are MIA, and that's exactly what TN's looking for. So instant snap response on that hookshot Ooh, flash in. Oh, the arrow would have been perfectly timed as well. And uh, that is really all it takes for us to respond. Bust a shot, knock him back, tick him down low. It shouldn't be lethal. But it should certainly be enough to warrant both uh, mid laners to go back to base. I think Harry just missed a potential solo kill there, Skimmy. You know, if he did get that last order before he bust shot him away, uh, that would have been the kill going towards him there. And the fact that when that phosphorus bomb did land, he did not have lethal. There was no follow up damage there. There was no final threat. So, you know, maybe ha Harry felt a bit pressured from the fact he does not have vision on the other sides of the mid lane right now. And he could be getting yanked from, you know, his raptor wall and stuff like that. Just wants to get out of there, just wants to reset. 
and get back into lane. Because, you know, if we do pay attention to the game state right now, while there is a gold lead for Blistol, it is a pretty even Steven game state. At pretty much every single lane uh, is even in terms of combat power right now. And these team fights are really going to come down to execution. So they are going to come down to execution. It feels like this entire series is going to be all about the execution. Certainly whilst the draft has a big hand in uh, making it easier, uh, it's nice to see how these teams are adapting. And there is that one bit of adaptation I asked from the very get-go in this game, right? What build will we see from Kevi's uh, Maokai is to be that of the Double Andrew junglers. So plenty of scouting and burning to take them down. Nature's Grasp to open things up. Three members rooted in place. There is the quickness and there is the charm. Kurek gone. Find a second one and try and deny even more of these grubs. Grand Zero will find two. Schoenfire forced to flash the safety. Blast Cone just as an insurance policy if anybody flashed over to follow. And these two solo laners in the top lane. Just hanging out. Australian top lane, Skimmy, with a, with a little bit of a... Upside down. Upside <laughs> down here. But, uh, you know, four grubs going to Bliss and two over to Ground Zero. So Ground Zero able to deny that, those five grubs. And uh, this is what probably the lane state we're going to see for quite a while going on now. It's just because, you know, Fido really good at clearing out the wave in a 2v1, especially against the, you know, Al uh, Aladoric without the grand entrance. There are three members of uh, Ground Zero up here right now. So if they do want to go on to Kevi, he's gonna in quite a lot of trouble. Oh, he should be really clever on that one. Once again, that arrow is so scary. See where that comes, it always skims them, but he just manages to dodge. And that could have been a really rough way to get out of that situation. Cop the tower shots or flash away to safety. Jukeson drives his way in the end. It's actually going to be Lemus, of all people, that holds it down the mid. Yeah, <laughs> Lemus is extremely aggressive right here. Ash is not, uh, you know, known for being a really strong champ into Tristan, especially, but doing a good job to, you know, staunch him off the way, push him away, make sure he is getting that priority still. So good confidence coming out of him. And you know, Harry doesn't really have a lot in his inventory. He, he does have the, uh, you know, the unfortunate Hearthbound Axe, which is, you know, coined the the second worst item in League right now after the, uh, you know, the bow, the one that no one. Oh, the slingshot. Yeah, the slingshot. No one really wants to build. So uh, <laughs> uh, while Kraken is a nice item, this is a really bad component to sit on. It just does not offer a lot for the amount of gold you spend on it. Yeah, it feels bad when you have to sit on those crucial items. It's just like, well, this doesn't really offer me too much, but that's all I can afford. No doubt, really, really hoping he gets a bit of, uh, you know, lane proximity to say 24 stacks left on the coal. Let me cash that in. Let me get that first item spike. Hit the Kraken, and then we can really start to fight back, no matter who it would be, be it the Corky or one of those tanks. But the lane swaps continue. It's been a very non-standard game. Pretty unconventional. Uh, but as it goes on and on and on, Grand Zero are finding better ways to respond back. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't really say there's a clear scaling advantage to either side as well. I think that uh, I'm not too familiar with how well Amumu does scale into the game. I think that uh, if you can avoid... Uh, I think when it comes to Maokai in the late game, the point and click is so important and it is so hard to outplay, especially when you don't have cleanse on some champions who can get locked down and blown up, whereas you look at Amumu, He's reliant on, you know, hitting those cues. He can go for that flash ult, but sometimes it's very easy to avoid, especially on champs like Tristana and Ezreal who are mobile and they can jump out of that one. So I think it's really going to come down to execution and I'm happy, Simi, that we are having this, uh, you know, even game state going uh, into the mid game where the laning phase is ending. And we are going to come down to those objective fights, which really are going to come down to the, the skill prowess of these players and not so much about a wallet gap. Let's see then, just uh, how much skill can be displayed because the gold difference continues to be as close as you would hope for it to be. 14 minutes in, plate's about to fall on down. Herald to be summoned to match that of the dragon being up and active in a case of splitting attention. Which objective becomes the priority? Not Trinity Falls has just been picked up then by Valet to match that of Linus on the Kraken Slay. So the Eddie carries are certainly feeling pretty inspired about their damage potential. But the two mid laners fighting up here in the north, they're going to have a little bit of a crack at it and say, look, Grubs, uh, rather the Herald, should be our uh, should be our priority. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, both teams prioritized the heralds. You know, we talk about how uh, the arrow going out that was going to be wasted. So a bit of pressure, you know, relief from Bliss. But back to the objectives. Uh, Grand Zero don't prioritize dragons, but at the same time they do love these heralds, right? We do see them take the the retails, but also Bliss. So both teams are quite even when it comes to how much they prioritize this objective. So I expect to see a lot of action happening around this one, especially if Shurnfire walks in and starts his objective already before his team is really with it. Agent Kevy hiding in the shadows, waiting to see if anybody would dare staunch him out of that bush. And that they certainly will. Find a control board in there and basically say, if you're not going to fight us, uh, you're not getting this Herald. So an easy acquisition there by Grand Zero. Going to be into the back pocket there of the Amumu as Bio finds himself in a nice little 1v1. Counter Strike goes up. Right, Pop awesome. for some nice resistances. But Tien, with that uh, Triforce difference, as you mentioned, has He's so dead. much damage. Waiting for the hook shot underneath the tower, and that is all she wrote. Yeah, that was just Bio jumping onto UC's initial Q to jump onto the wave under the tower to get a plate proc. But Tien coming out of base with that Triforce 
in his inventory, catches him off guard, and that's just the cooldown advantage in the side lane, and that is going to swing this matchup completely. We do not see the Triforce being completed by by at all. Did decide to go for those groups because he was running around the map and he wanted a bit of extra move speed. So this is going to swing that Camille Jax matchup on the side, and that could swing the game dy dynamic altogether. And it must feel absolutely phenomenal for TN, knowing how poorly those first five, ten minutes went, right? Down two levels, down so much gold, down so much pressure, to come back with the first item spike and then get the kill on top of that. Uh, yeah, night and day. Yeah, definitely it would feel very good. Getting a solo kill in such an important game, in such a hard, you know, tough matchup or a skill matchup is always really nice, especially as a top laner. But, you know, we are seeing the priority of, you know, both mid laners getting as much free time on the side lanes as we can. And we do see the Triforce being completed by Bio now. So, four Triforces in the game already. Unfortunately, not giving me that Tri Triforce. It is that Quad Force this game's giving me. So, it is an unlucky number to have on the champion, but an engage already. Big engage, Flash, uh, Twisted Advance, run to Kurek, who jumps away to safety. Out goes the Ash Arrow, two kills so far on Lima, so he wants to make sure that he can do a fair bit of damage in this one, but Double Summoner's burnt by him to disengage away. Sure. Explosive shot is huge, but sure it finds Curse of the Sad Mummy is massive! It stuns everybody, but he can't Lemus. find any kills. He will die, but Lemus is space gliding through the river into the mid lane. Fido playing cleanup with the Rocket Frostorus. Brom nets himself a double kill, but it's all about the engage from Shern. What did we see again, Simi? We, we just saw a hard force onto Kurak again, and he's playing Brom this time. He's not playing Leona or <laughs> Nautilus, you know, who are naturally tanked. He's playing Brom. An extremely hard chance to kill. Throws up the door, jumps back to his teammate, has the flash, buys so much time for his team. So once again, we see teams engaging on Kurak. What is it about this player that makes everyone want to kill him? I don't understand. I really don't understand. There's something about it. He just, he takes no damage. He causes everybody to say, yeah, look, bud, you're the rookie. We need to kind of humble you. And he just laughs. He just does not die. Refuses to. Yeah, and this is just the claps coming out of this team. Correct. Once again, buying so much time. The flash engage coming, or the, just the engage coming out of Aldor. Gleam is respecting that with his cleanse flash himself. But Schoenfire, what a turn from him. You know, he does fall down, but that creates so much disruption for the team. So much damage, which allows Fido to go for, which allows Lemus to just fire arrows into this team. And, and Fido finds that cleanup with that flash at the end. It really is the epitome of a marksman there, just sitting from afar, raining arrows. And, uh, and locking him down. Really is uh, a nice affair to showcase just how strong he was at that point of the game. And now the double AD carry threat is 4-0, which is certainly a, a nice position to find the yourself arrow. in. Bypepper locked in place by all oh, that CC. It just lasts far too long. And Bio thought it was enough to try and contend with Tien. Now, add Shun to the mix. And there, Lemus finally hits that cross map arrow onto a crucial member in Bio. But once again, Kurak on the side. He's a mortal skinny. He is a model. Nobody can take him down. I mean, I'm, I'm almost sick of saying it at this point, right? It's almost like a known quantity. That needs to be a nickname or something. So we'll find something, I'm sure, by the end of this best of five, perhaps by the end of the split, to summarize what Curex done uh, this season, really. It's the Bendy effect. You know, he just he, perf <laughs> he perfected the Bendy playstyle of overextending, and he just locked it. You know, instead of playing Heimer, instead of playing these squishy champions who die, he's playing tanks. And no one can kill these champions. It's true. Benvy was actually really good at causing people to try and go for him. The question is, well, the problem with that, right, is he did play the Heimer, and sometimes he would happen to go 0-8. But, you know, beside the point, you play a tank, and it's a whole nother, uh, another situation, right? 19 minutes into this game, uh, and whilst Bliss had a phenomenal start to this one, they've lost all that gold lead, and it's actually swung 2k in Grand Zero's favor. Yeah, and this is the, the strength of Grand Zero. We just talk about how good they are at playing the mid-game. Their macro is just on another level when it comes to this league, and... Their, you know, priority on getting gold and experience is so nice to see. We do see Shonfire starting to get ahead a little bit in the jungle department. Is going for a full AP and movement build this time. So not going to be, you know, that pseudo tank is going to go in and either, you know, one for one or just die. So this is exciting to see this movement build. It's a different look from the champion. And Tien on his, you know, heavily favorite champion, the one who's had the most success on this split, already doing so well at this point in the game. And it's just going to get worse for Jax with this, uh, you know, disadvantage. Absolutely. 0-4 oh, now for Bio Panther. Really feels bad. So he's going to sting the ego a fair bit there, knowing that uh, once that Revenous Hydra goes online. Uh, really, I have no chance whatsoever containing this one. I will need a little bit of assistance, and I will need my team to try and rally and find fights like this. Starts off with Alador, assisted by Kevy, and a shutdown, most importantly, is picked up by Violet. Lemus trying to be Kurak, but you just, you're just not him. You're not him. You can't walk up. You can't disrespect like that. <laughs> Doesn't have the flash. He does fall down, but also something to note. Did Bio Panther sell his boots? Give me did have the cooldown boots, right? Oh, I need to check the vault. I need to check the vault. We'll do it live. I'll look it up. I'm pretty sure he did sell his boots, so he's replaced them with the Merc Treads, you know, but if he thinks the CC coming out of the Amumu is too much to deal with, but that's just so much gold being uh, removed from his pockets, but the Baron being started at 20 minutes, Shonfire walking here, does not have the flash. How much damage is this Baron taking? Will they be able to make it? 
They have no vision, but they have an idea, given that they had the Scuttler just moments prior. That is about to expire. That one does fall on down. TP's coming on through. Is it too little, too late? Elidora across the wall hits the charm. A two-man route with the uh, Maokai ultimate is fantastic, and they've snuck it away. That is crazy! What a mistake for, you know, the side of the ground zero, but especially in Lemus. The fact he done that mid wave there was disrespecting in that, you know, outnumbered situation and all, you know, all members of Bliss, five man Baron, five man reset, they're back in the game scheme. You know, this, got, this was a 2,000 gold lead for ground zero and all of a sudden they have this Baron, they have some time to get more items on their team and when they start to get some, you know, items to really, really deal with or match up to the DPS coming out of the ground zero side, it's going to be a swing completely. That's the stabilizer, it certainly is the Baron effect. What can it do to actually uh, get them back into this one, right? How much gold can we look to try and find through some siege and success in that regard? Or is it really a case of, uh, we want to deny it from you. You're getting a little bit too strong and we can't afford that to happen. And as you mentioned, I've checked it. Yeah, it was those CDR boots sold out for the Merc trade. So it's going to put by even further behind and it makes it even more dicey as yet again, another arrow goes out and stunned for what feels like two and a half seconds means that anybody can pounce upon you and Fido's there to claim. Yeah, this is just the, you know, this is one of the classic, you know, deploy the three lanes, catch all the waves. You have to be very careful because you are susceptible to getting engaged on, especially when you are down tempo from a team who is already on the map, already has vision control and can, you know, thanks to that mid priority, they have fine picks on the side lane. So Lemus, once again, locks the Ashen, finds the arrows twice now onto the side laners and is just securing some kills for his team. But what's the reason why they were in the state to begin with, Skimmy? It's certainly where Blackfire Torch now picked up, so the same build from Shern mirrored one more time. So much damage. Incredibly squishy, but doesn't really matter if you can continue to hit these multi-man ultimates time and time again and say, well, the rest of my team is strong enough. All I need to do is get the party started. And that's certainly what they've done in this game, right? They have just been so excited to say, no, Fido. you never need to panic. We're always in control. Let's see, though, what Fire can do to try and get himself out of this precarious situation because he's going to be surrounded by two, soon to be free with that TP coming in there by Harry, who no doubt wants to pick up the kill for himself. There is the charm. There's Fire getting amongst it as well. But there is that all important shutdown into Harry's pockets. Yeah, seeing a bit of disrespect on the side lane, you know, just an overextension. Fido doesn't have his team in his pocket that time. No TP on TN to be able to back him up there. Really nice battle dog to recognize he can walk down with that TP advantage, but the arrow onto Kevy dodged out, so he's going to be very happy that the one is on cooldown, and this is the dragon coming up in 15 seconds, and there's no fighter and there's no engage tool to really deal with the backline of Bliss right now. See then what they decide to do. Dragon a piece. It really is uh, as smooth as it could be in terms of an objective that neither side tends to prioritize. Oh, no. Let's see what it means for Kurak again. He says, Can you catch me, guys? I'm going to continue to taunt, uh, we'll taunt you all series long. Yeah. Okay, so they are looking onto Lemus this time. They have recognized, you know what? Kurak's immortal. Let's ignore him. Let's focus onto Lemus. But Lemus has the flashing cleanse this time, and they did not use that timer to get the dragon where uh, Fido was dead. So believe they can't contest this one. They want to just go topside, trade this one off. This is only the second dragon, right? So not really a big win condition and the soul in particular isn't too strong for either team. So just a, you know, a nice thing to have, but something you shouldn't put yourself at risk for, especially when you are working towards, you know, those bigger item power spikes tool. Yeah, it's not the hill they want to try and die on at this stage, right? They know the fact that both Harry and Violet are incredibly strong and they match the power of their respective opponents, but elsewhere they are sorely lagging behind. They need a bit of catch-up, and it's uh, catch-up I don't think Grand Zero are going to let them find. It's going to come down to a lot of these uh, solo lanes getting picked apart, but Kevy behind in the enemy jungle, looks to try and isolate out some crucial members. Kurak is there, so it means obviously Grand Zero do win. That's just how it's always oh. been. The Ash Arrow will certainly confirm that as he just evades that winter spike. But a cheeky ignite will get it started. We see Ground Zero do this so many times. They play the numbers advantage on the side and they still take these fights, but Tien's gimme. Locking down Eldora. Tien is definitely making sure that Eldora can't get, uh, you know, cute and clever with this quickness. So that ultimate is just going to be traded one for one. Nothing to come of it. And they will say, just look at the map right now. We have so much vision control. And for Bliss, it's a case of we need to make sure that we aren't getting flanked in our own side of the jungle. Yeah, and you know, the own side of the jungle doesn't really uh, exist to Ground Zero, right? They constantly fight for, you know, both sides of the jungle. They have the numbers of advantage on the bot side, but Kurak and Fido by themselves fight that, you know, outnumbered advantage of the 3v2 there on the top side, and they just, you know, they're playing for the rotation of the rest of the Ground Zero members, and Kevi doesn't feel too comfortable committing all together, and I think this is this hesitation that Bliss keeps showing on, you know, their strong side of the jungle is the reason they keep getting caught off guard. The fact that they are getting forced out at a numbers advantage is really surprising. And I think that they need to recognize this one. This is something you need to uh, see in the review as a team and make sure that doesn't really happen in these, you know, future games. 
And it almost seems like more and more of what Sher mentioned in his uh, interview is coming to fruition, right? The fact that, you know, we're quite happy sticking to our own style. It's a case of Bliss and other teams having to try and figure out ways to beat us, which uh, we're seeing demonstrated again, right? The case of you're banning away all these pocket champions, you're switching the sides around, but still Grand Zero looks so, so comfortable. Yeah, they just look so comfortable. Even though, like, we would say Grand Zero had been on the back foot from the early game, they they just look too comfortable, right? They keep playing the same way. They haven't really changed anything. Shernfire's always rocking off these objectives, and he is trying to take them away. They are being punished this time because Bliss, uh, you know, thanks to that really early, or nice early game, nice early swap they did, was able to catch him off guard, and they were able to put him a little bit behind. But still, Shern is strong. He still has that camp lead. He still has the items he needs. He has bought that potion in his inventory, so they are looking for a fight, Skimmy. They're all in believing this is the fight of all fights that should set the tone for the rest of this game. Certainly propel them into a late game where they are heavily favoured to take out the victory. Let's see then. The first Baron stolen away in classic T1 fashion. Can the second one be done in such a convincing manner? Or will Grand Zero have something to say about that? They started off perfectly. They claim that mid lane control. They rotate into the river where uh, Maokai was primed and ready to go. Oh, in with the flash engage. Aladorix tokes it up with that enchanted crystal arrow. It's going to be a one man ultimate coming out of Schoenfire as Harry tries to rocket jump to safety, but Schoenfire denies that possibility. Fido plays cleanup crew on the initial Blizz dive engage. And they take two, and they lose nothing. Easy as that, you know, it's pretty much all on Violet now, Skimmy. Uh, Shonfire does a really good job to find out Harry there, but you know, this is still gonna be a dance that if they do not take out Violet, they, he can still push down this Baron, right? And the only member who can really get onto him is Tien, but so much damage from that, you know, precision protocol, that might just force them off and uh, give them that confidence to go take that Baron comfortably. Seems to me they're going to have to sacrifice this objective, unfortunately, for them. Split apart, different ideas, tried to force a fight and just completely deterred about it. The turnaround potential of the Ash, the Yamumu, as well as that Brom, too much to bear. The three-man party looks to say, what can we do? Jax jumps in, hits the one-man counter strike, gets a crucial shutdown. The 9TN for what feels like an eternity. He did that so, so much. Violet tries to do what he can. They trade both Eddie Carries dying like Romeo and Juliet for 50 damn seconds. Harry has to do it. But in comes Harry with the TP. He's respawned, he's rejuvenated. He's Harry. got a triple item spike. So he'll find a triple kill seemingly. He sat around, and then finally the rocket jump nets in the ace. The Goomba stomps here, to finish that one off. Triple kill picked up for Harry, all Barons denied onto the side of Ground Zero, but we finally saw it, right? They committed, they didn't hesitate. They, I think that Ground Zero feel so confident in these fights, and they're really overstepping their bounds here. And the fact that Tien went in without that ult to dodge out on the Counter-Strike that comes out of buy here means he's locked down, and there's going to be the easy pickup. Finally, we see Kevy flash in set up to his spot lane. Unfortunately, that true shot barrage goes wide, which means uh, probably Violet lives here, and this fight would have been even more one-sided, but his overall nice skirmish from here, and the fact that Harry recognizes he has to go, and this is dual die. This is their one winner to find the advantage back in this game, and he commits on it. It's good to see. Incredibly defining moment in this series, you would have to say, right, the fact that the Baron gets picked up, you think that Grand Zero has done enough from that initial play, but based on the respawn time, it's still being so early into this game, it affords Harry a second lease on life, gets the TP in, gets to play cleanup crew, and gets to make sure that he continues to be the focus of this team comp. Yeah, now with the gold still being, it's just 28 minutes in this game, I wonder where, the, you know, the, the major power spike difference is, because I think if I look at the inventory right now, uh, Lemus is strong, right? His DPS is so consistent, it is, you know, uh, very easy to deal with, whereas, you know, other side, Violet is strong, and it is in the pocket of Harry right now, but he, it has base, if Violet just goes down the mid lane, Skippy. Oh, well, yeah, you say one good thing, and the player falls on down, unfortunately. Next to gold to Manim, counted there by the Nature's Grass, not to be enough, though, unfortunately. They find a little bit of salvation underneath their mid-tier two. Elador tries to buy some time by jumping in with a two-man charm. Not to be enough. Members falling on down low. Members dying. What just happened? And unfortunately, map control just gifted to ground zero. I, this might just be a close to game, Skimmy. They still have, uh, you know, shown by Witty's ult if he does rotate over this one, but I think they might try to end this one here. Uh, even though they do not have the cooldowns, there's no real threat to clear this wave. It's only Harry. There's no engage out of Elador. And it's so easy for them to hit these towers. It's still 10 seconds on, you know, Violet and Kevy coming up after him. That is certainly, yeah, so they look to try and jump straight into Harry's head. They lock him in place for such a long time. Too much CC to get through there, Tally. It is just too oppressive, too frustrating, and too damn annoying. We're not even 90 minutes into this series, and Ground Zero are already on match point. What a performance out of this team. You know, they got caught off guard in the early game, but this is just the the reps, right? They've, they've played this style so many times, they know how to get back in the game, and I think that Lemus and Kurek in particular, the fact they never die to these engages, is doing so much work for Ground Zero. They are afforded so much luxury in the ability to play out their lanes and play with so much confidence, knowing that really, Bliss, uh, you're on the back foot, you're the ones that are now becoming more and more of the underdog.